open up your Bibles, if you will. Open up to 1 Kings. I believe in miracles, and I think you believe in miracles also. And it's kind of fashionable to play down the supernatural things of God and to play down uh, the style of worship that we have in this church. I, I reverently remind you when David danced before the Lord, he didn't have on his kingly garments. He had removed his, his outer garments and he had on the garments of a priest. He had on white linen. And, and the Hebrew says that he spun violently before the Lord. He was spinning like a top. And he was doing that for miles as he came up the roads. And Saul's daughter, who was a lot like her father, Shaul, was looking out the window, and the word says she disdained him. She hated him. She basically, and, and then she lays into him and basically says, you, and I'm paraphrasing, you look like a fool. You, you belittled yourself. You lowered yourself in the sight of your people. And her reward was she died barren. She never had any children. Now, that's not just a big deal in our generation, in our society, but in that time, that was a big deal. So be careful. Be careful of disdaining the praise of God. Be careful of, of not liking and almost hating and saying, wow, they're, they're foolish. Those people are foolish. And size means nothing. God measures the heart. He looks upon the heart. And so, so I want you to look at 1 Kings today in the 17th chapter. This is a great, great story. Elijah runs into a widow woman. And, and a lot of the things I believe that we experience are there so that we can tap into the supernatural power of God. God wants to prove himself to us. And how does God prove himself to us? If there's no need, we turn to God in our hour of need most of the time. L let, me, let me read the, uh, the passage. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, now uh, that, that brings a lot of thought to me because immediately I'm saying most widows, not only of today, but back in that day especially, would have had nothing. Why, why would God seek out the lowliest, the poorest, and say she's going to provide for the prophet? I mean, he didn't look to the richest guy in town. He didn't say, go over to Brother Bob's house. You know, he's a multimillionaire. He could have, and it would have been okay. I say this all the time. This is the big, biggest mistake in a believer's life. Well, I, I don't have to give God anything because I'm being blessed. I said, oh, really? Well, uh, are you a thousandaire? Yeah. How do you know God doesn't want you to be a millionaire? I really believe this. I really believe we, sh we stop short of, we, we, we begin to deduce and say, well, wait a minute, but I, I'm doing okay. I'm, be, I'm really blessed. Are you really, 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 really blessed? Because the principle is the same. For you thousandaires, you still have to sow in order to reap. And, and then you millionaires... If you want to be billionaires, you got to sow in order to reap. The principle is the same. I, I, 
You know what? If you, if you knew how many people in this church, we've been here 36 years. <clears throat> and, and, I, and I hate to tell you this, but a lot of them, once God started blessing them, they moved on. They don't go to church anymore. Their children aren't in church anymore. But when I took this church, I had a ton of ladies that were on welfare. And, and I would say to them, you don't want to stay on welfare. Well, because of insecurity, well, I, I make more on welfare than I can if I go get a job. And I said, no, don't think that way. And, and I've, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again for you that are new here, you that are, are old, just bear with me. Opportunity has what I call lines of interdiction. Does that make sense to you? See, see, life has lines that interdict. They cross. So, if and, and, and welfare was like a trench. They were b below the radar. They were in this trench, and they were plodding along, and most of them were the product of grandma, mom, on and on and on and on. I'm not, I'm not putting you say, well, man, I'm in that situation, and I couldn't make it. I couldn't feed my kids. That's cool. That's fine. I get it. But don't develop a mentality that forever and ever and ever, I'm going to remain on welfare. You're making a mistake. And it took me years to convince. In fact, we actually found the place that she moved into. He was, his kids went with our kids to Christian school, and, and we recommended her, and I, I don't think she's living there now. Do you know if she is or not? But uh, she lived there for many, 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 many years. But uh, I'm just using this as an example, but we've had tons of this in the church. One day she dared to believe what I'm just getting ready to preach to you. She crawled out of the trench of welfare and she went to, the wor to work for a bank. And I'm sure she wasn't making much more than what she could have got on welfare. But one day this guy walked in, another banker, and she was working and she was busy and something got his attention and he said to her, how would you like to go to work for me at my bank? Line of interdiction. If she hadn't got out of the trench and got into the workforce, there would have been no line of interdiction. So she went over there. Last time I saw her, she was driving a really, really neat uh, convertible sports car, and she was making all kinds of money. And some of you know probably who I'm talking about. So, so don't think that way. Don't think I've arrived. You, you, got, you got to press forward. If you're a thousandaire, you want to be a millionaire. If you're a millionaire, you want to be a billionaire. Why? To help people. To build the kingdom of God. God has given you a stewardship, and you will be judged on your stewardship. What did you do with what God gave to you? How did you increase the kingdom? Who did you bless? Now, a lot of people, they're going to let this go in one ear and out the other, but it's true. Now, now, get back on my thing. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you because God is really the provider. He's behind everything. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there, was there gathering sticks. She didn't have the money to go get firewood. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, notice, notice and that's going to be part of the teaching today. Obedience is a key to your success. And the word, the, the, you say, well, where'd you get that? He asked for a cup of water. She went and got it. She obeyed. He called to her and he said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So, and here comes, here it comes. Here comes the test. She didn't have anything. This guy not only is interrupted her daily work of gathering sticks, now he presumptuously said, and by the way, go get me some water. 
Man, I'm about to starve to death. What's the matter with you? You're a prophet and you don't know where I'm at? You don't know the condition? It was a test. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Boy, I mean, either God is the smartest guy in the world or the dumbest. And I, and I, I please, just don't criticize me, okay? Only a handful of flour in a bin, she said. I do not have bread. I only have a little handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Boy, she was really a woman of faith. <laughs> Sounds like us, doesn't it? And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up nor, the sh nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. That, that's a pretty fair exchange. Be obedient, do what I tell you to do, and you will have an unlimited supply. And they were in a famine, they, they needed rain. He says, and then when the earth can produce again, then you don't, you don't need that miracle. A miracle is for a period, a time. So she went away and did according, here we go, obedience to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Now we're going to pull it up to our time. We're going we're to make it. Now here you sit. I, I don't know all your, your conditions out there. God does. But, but I'm going to listen to this very clear, clearly. The economics and the economies, but economics of stewardship are governed by the mathematics of the supernatural. Do, do you get that? Anybody didn't get it? How, how can I be blessed? By the supernatural. I, I, the, these are not mine. The, the, word, uh, the world uses these, but I make them mine. I call them Philippisms. One of the world's uh, quotes is, work smarter, not harder. I learned that. I, I, I worked for years and years and years in the steel industry. You can kill yourself in the steel industry. We, we were handling material that was the size of the whole side of that church. One sheet. We were handling material that was two and a half to three inches thick. We were running furnaces that got up to 23 to 24 to 2500 degrees. Overhead cranes cutting torches, you name it, shears, rolls, presses, noise like you couldn't hear. So if you're going to make it, you'll only make it as you partner with a supernatural. Say it again. The economies of stewardship, and stewardship means how do you manage what God has given to you? You're a steward. That's what you are. You're a steward over whatever God has given to you and your increase will be governed by the mathematics of the supernatural. It's working smarter, not harder. And we're going to find out here, I've got to get moving here, three things that are required for what I call miraculous mul multiplication. You see, I... I 
it's amazing. See, I don't have a problem with wealth. I don't have a problem with blessings. But I, I know in some churches, and I've been in some of those churches, like, like the last church we were pastoring, there was this lady, she thought her calling in life was to suffer for God. I mean suffer for God, hurt. I didn't like being around her. She reveled in it. She loved it. She enjoyed it. I, I don't know what you do with by his stripes you are healed. We just quoted a scripture that when we pray, God hears our prayer. But, you know, that's her choice. That, that's what she laid claim to. That, that's what she confessed. And, and I know this works because from the time I was a little guy, and, th and this, this was my point, and I, and I missed it, but it came back to me. <clears throat> the girl that crawled out of the trench of welfare, and we had, I don't know how many people in the church that have done that. People don't understand this. I'll, we'll take an offering, and they'll say, I don't have anything. I'll say, do you have a penny? Yeah. Do you have a nickel? Yeah. Do you have a dime? Yeah. Give it. Put it. Well, pastor, that is so slight, that is so minute, that, don't, that does not mean anything. The, the little lady that didn't have anything gave her all. And God's accommodation of her was she was a better giver than the best giver there. Because they, they didn't give out of their want. She had nothing. In a sense, she gave everything. Which is probably just a few pennies, a few denarius. No, I don't think it was a denarius because a denarius was a day's work. So she just had, I'm going to say she threw in three pennies. And God was impressed because that's all she had. Are, are we getting it? In order to get more, you've got to give. There is no way that it will. I mean, now you say, well, I'm being pretty well blessed. Did you not hear what I said when I started out? Why would you want to stay a thousandaire or a hundredaire when you could be a millionaire? Well, give me the benefits of being rich. You sleep better at night. You don't get ulcers. You don't wonder where the next meal is coming from. There's a th millions of benefits for having money. I don't know who educated you into believing, and I don't think there's anybody here, that somehow it's real spiritual to be broke. I don't think it's spiritual to be broke. I hate being broke. You know, i I kind of been lying to you a, a lot of years. You know, I'll get up here and I'll say stuff, and I got more stuff, and I love stuff. <laughs> and I clear all this stuff out, and then I, boy, I got room for more stuff, right? <laughs> I've always loved toys. When I, I couldn't wait for Christmas, man. I mean, I can remember Christmas would come. I found every, every year, I found everything my mom and dad was going to give me. Even when I told them I believed in Santa Claus, I'd already gone through all the presents, okay? I'd tried out my BB gun. I put on my motorcycle boot. We call them motorcycle boots, don't you? Yeah, engineer boots. I went in and I wore them around, I, you know. Cause I, wh why? Because I liked stuff. Bicycles. And I started accumulating. When I, you know, you could drive when you were 14, but I was driving when I was 12, man. And, and I remember, you know, I got a 38 police special and I traded it for a 31 Model A. Didn't have no license, but I had a 31 Model A and I drove it all over the place. I'm just confessing. I've had to repent about a lot of things. <laughs> then my next car was a 37 Ford Humpback. 
and then just up, 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 up. The point is, we all like stuff. Don't, don't, don't lie to me, okay? We all like stuff. Now, we say we don't like stuff, and we don't know where to put it, and we don't know where to store it. You know, give it away. So i kind of been fibbing. You know, I said, you know, I'm tired of stuff. No, I'm not tired of stuff. That's like saying I'm tired of chili with the anos, right? Bring me some, okay, and you'll see how tired of them I am. So there's going to be, th if you want to be blessed, now we'll say, we'll quote a scripture. Uh, As you sow, so shall you reap. Cast your bed upon the waters after many days it will return unto you. It, it, that's good. The scripture's good. But I break it down a little farther. There are three things that are required for miraculous multiplication. And that's why we use this scripture. That was miraculous multipl multiplication. But you can have the same thing wherever you are. I don't care where you're at. You say, well, I'm on welfare. And I can barely put anything in this morning. Put something in. Put 50 cents, a quarter, a dollar. So, so you can reap. It's going to take three things. It's going to think, take confidence, and that's what the devil really works, on, works us over on. He robs us of our confidence. You do that, man, and you're going broke. Two, obedience. She obeyed. And three, of course, courage. When faced with a major need, express confidence in the need Meet her. Who's the need meter? Jesus. He'll meet your needs. He'll, now, you say, oh, well, wait a minute. I, I prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing fell in my lap. How about ideas? How about, how about an interdiction line that a guy comes in and says, why don't you come and go to work for me? See, see, we limit, we limit God. It's, it's, it's my way or the highway. Well, you're, you're, you're done. You're done. I mean, can you imagine the guy that walked in and told his family, guess what? I got the greatest thing since popcorn. They said, what's that? The hula hoop. A hula hoop. Well, what do you do with it? Oh, you put it on and you go like this. They probably said, we, we need to lock this guy up. Like the slinky. You know, you all know the story of the slinky. The guy, it, it was just the tailings off of a machinist. And his wife still, the guy died, is dead. The wife still has slinky. And she never moved it out of the town that it was invented in. And produced in. It's still there. I was watching a special of it the other day. I mean, I was, what was that song we were listening to on the radio? And I said, and they make fun of our music. Do you remember what it was? Well, well think about Elvis Presley's song. What was it? You, you, you can step in my face. You can slander my name all over the place. Baby, don't step on my shoes. Boy, those, are, those words, they, they'll quiver. They quiver inside of you, don't they? Or, or I remember this one when I was growing up. Bop, bop, aluma, that's my baby. Bop, bop, aluma. I don't mean maybe. Bop, bop, a luma, that's my baby. Oh. So the next time the devil says, boy, your song stinks, think about bop, bop, a luma. <laughs> right? <laughs> Charlene and I, we were in, uh, was it Sir Richard's? Is that the name of that place over there on Whittier? They were playing Honky Tonk Western. We had to leave, it so depressed us. There was nothing good about those songs. And they just, and not only was the music bad and the voices bad, but the words were worse. 
So, so the devil's going to work on you. So go to the need meter. You've got to pray. You've got to pray and pray and pray. And then when God gives you a way, an out, then you need to, you need to listen. And this applies, Michael mentioned this, this is, applies especially when you don't comprehend God's purpose at work. A lot of stuff I go, this is the craziest thing I've ever been asked to do. This doesn't make any sense. I need money. I don't have time to pray. You ever felt that way? I'm too sick to pray. Like Abraham, we must rely on the one who is eminently able. God is able. I just, I just read the prophecy. I'm the smartest thing in the whole world. <laughs> I thought I was. As God called Abraham to a life of obedience, he calls us. As God tested Abraham, he also tests us. As God called Abraham to a life of faith, he calls you and me to a life of faith. We're going to live this life by faith. When faced with major need, be obedient to God's directions. If the believer is to tap into the endless resources of God, they must exercise faith by acting in obedience to God's word. You've got to be obedient. If the word says so, you've got to so. You can't reap until you sow. Paul reminds us in Romans, you know, there's secrets all through the Bible. I want more faith. Faith cometh by hearing. You got the key. What? Faith cometh by hearing. When you hear success stories, that builds your faith. When one is prompted by the word of God or by the leading of the Holy Spirit, obedience to that prompting is an expression of faith. And if your faith is weak, you'll, you'll ignore it. Such a response of faith enables the believer to enter into partnership with God. It will ensure your success even though the end may not yet be in sight. That's the problem. I'm telling you, God's going to say, do you know how far away you were from absolute total success? One hour. Two feet. You quit. And you were right there at the doorstep of success. When faced with a major need, last point, ask God for the courage to stay the course and get ready for a great adventure. Life is just full of adventures. The life is faith-filled stewardship. And it's anything but boring. Life is any... I, I hate it when people say, well, I'm bored with life. Well, psh, you ain't living my life. <laughs> life isn't boring. You know, Michael made a real good point. Bill Gaither, a great teacher. I don't know if Bill Gaither's still alive or not. Anybody know if Bill Gaither still is he? He has a great teaching on the birth of a vision. But the problem is Christians will never, never accept the death of a vision. We've got to let visions die. You get to a point you've got to say, this, ain't, this is not what God wants me to do anymore. God births visions and he kills visions. And we've got to be able to accept that. Noah, for example, had never experienced a flood, nor had, e had he ever seen rain. It never rained. The, it was mist that watered. And I've told you this a thousand times. One hundred years to build the ark. Can you imagine the, the mocking? and the, What are you building? I'm building an ark. What for? You know. Yeah, it's going to rain. Well, it hadn't rained for a hundred years. 
And he was out there every day beating and hammering. He was obedient to the thing. Good thing he built it. We wouldn't be here. This was a man of faith and courage, and he obeyed and had total trust in God. He didn't understand it, but he trusted. God's command did not specify time or limits, and Noah responded accordingly. Don't put God on a timetable. If the enemy is allowed to undermine your faith in any one area, then your whole faith walk in God becomes subject to collapse. It, it's like a house built on cards. Then I said, let us close by keeping these scriptures in mind. I'll quote them. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, but without faith, say it with me, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. He's what? Smarter than everybody. Holier than everybody. More powerful than everybody. Got more wisdom than everybody. Because that, that, that's the truth. That he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then finally, Romans 10, 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, black or white, male or female. You see, they think this is a recent thing. Women's rights. Women's this, women's that. It's been around forever. The men were off scaladenting around. It was the women who looked for Jesus. It was the women who said, hey, I went to the tomb, and he's not there. And then here come these two great apostles. They come scooting down through there like running, like chickens with their heads off, based on the report of the women. Thank God there were some women around. Poor old Jesus gives himself totally and completely, and Peter's answer was, I'm going fishing. <laughs> Anybody want to go with me? Yeah, we want to go too. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all, who call upon him. Well, I'm a poor old widow woman. You're rich. I don't have a man. You're rich. You might even be saying, thank God. <laughs> well, what is he saying there? There's no barriers. Don't use these lame excuses. Well, I'm not college educa educated. So what? Neither was Edison. Neither was Henry Ford. I did a whole series on these guys for you. They barely had fourth and fifth grade educations. First car Ford built, I told you. First car Ford built, he forgot to put reverse in it. He was so excited about it going forward, he didn't know it had to go backwards. And praise God, he didn't quit. I, I like, you know, I, I love when you, these guys. I love their their character traits. He said, "You can have any color you want as long as it's black." <laughs> See, we think, you know, like in the in the black black is beautiful. Ford thought black was beautiful way back in 1909 and 1910 and 19, you know, 19. They like to never got him to build anything other than a Model T. Finally, somebody talked him into building a Model A and a Model B. And thank God, because we would have no hot rods today if there wasn't any Model A's or Model B's, okay? <laughs> I'm being...